The Black Bean Puck At sixty-something, I was convinced that invisibility was the natural state of affairs, until I met Brad. It was the playoffs, and the Lakers were battling the Nuggets. Invisibility starts in the 40s. It is so politically incorrect to expect catcalls from construction workers when passing a construction site. The sounds are more noticeable when they are no longer heard. In the 50s, confidence still abounds. Who needs the catcalls to feel vital? The invisibility sets in during the 60s. Doors are not held for you except by a maitre d'. Some servers might call you sweetie if you are in a casual restaurant. And the AARP magazine holds no interest for you because you do not need to be reminded that you are very much a senior. On this extraordinary night of the playoffs, I was visible. I took the last empty seat and craned my neck to see the screen. I sat next to Brad and probably was a little too close to him, but it was the only way I could see the game. I apologized for being too close to him, and he said, no need to apologize. I would like to take your picture. I was shocked. Brad had a very big professional camera and said that he was a photographer. I tried to be nonchalant, even though my heart was pounding and I wanted to be in denial. I was pretty used to being invisible. Maybe it was the hat or the scarf or the peach-colored shirt I was wearing, but something was making me quite visible. In my 30s and 40s and even 50s, I had had many photos taken of my face, hands, contorted yoga poses, but this decade was not one in which I was asked to have my picture taken. I looked at Brad as he focused his camera. He said, just think of relaxing on the beach. All I could think of was the wrinkles in my neck, and then I remembered advice that was given to me in my 40s by a photographer. Turn your head and look up. It hides the wrinkles. This is exactly what I did when Brad said to think about being on the beach. Brad did a beautiful job. The lighting was superb, and the photo was beautiful. My hat was at an angle. I looked saucy, intelligent, and fun-loving. Brad said he would email me the photo. He told me that I was very attractive and beautiful. I couldn't believe that this was happening. I had thoroughly resigned myself to invisibility, and now this. I asked Brad if he drinks too much. He made an unconscious gesture of acknowledgement, and I said, I see. He said, what? I didn't say anything. I said, remember, I'm a shrink. I can read these things. We looked at the appetizer menu, and the chicken nachos looked good. He ordered, and we shared the dish. How romantic. I can't remember the last time I shared a dish using two forks and one plate. He asked if I would come home with him. I said no. He then asked if he could come home with me. Again, I said no. He wanted to know what was wrong, and I said, I just didn't do that. He said, never. I said, after five sober times, I might think about it. That started a whole series of questions like, after five minutes, is that number one? I said, you are at zero. There is no number one. Number one does not start tonight. He said I was hard. I said I was decisive. He chilled and I resumed watching the game. It was a massacre. The Lakers lost by 21 points. Brad didn't seem to care too much. He was more into me than the game. He was starting to sober up, and I had mixed feelings about that. Would I have to fend him off, or would he just go away quietly? The evening did not end with my musing about Brad. 
After the extremely disappointing loss, the conversation at the bar centered around sports in general. Eric was a passionate surfer. The waves had not been good for the past two weeks. He had broken up with his girlfriend after their surfing trip to Costa Rica. The girlfriend wasn't willing to put up with being without Eric for endless hours while Eric was surfing. He would leave at five in the morning and not return until mid-morning. This may have worked, except that everyone else in the village was also surfing at five in the morning, and the girlfriend couldn't even get a cup of coffee. John was a retired pilot for Delta and ex-military. He had a great smile and looked like a leprechaun. He lost $50 on the game, but didn't seem to mind too much. Eric was the most impressive and interesting of the lot. He was 6'5 and looked like a linebacker. In fact, his sport was baseball. His claim to fame was a pitch of 90 miles per hour. He immediately volunteered that his liver was shot because of the amount of Advil he had to take while he was on the road. The highlight of the post-game festivities was a food fight that I had with Mr. Surfer. Mind you, I was sober, so I have no real excuse for participating in a grown-up food fight. From the nachos that I had shared with Brad, there was one little black bean nearly hidden by my empty margarita glass. It was just the little one, but it was clearly waiting to be our little food fight puck. I made the first serve, which was quickly returned by Mr. Surfer. It was a wild return and nearly landed out of bounds. That is, it nearly landed on the floor. My reflexes were quick. I returned the bean with a quick return right down the middle of the counter. Mr. Surfer was expecting it and countered with a fast return. I felt like I was an adolescent again, playing miniature hockey in my aunt's recreation room. Mr. Surfer placed the bean puck front and center. I returned the pass. It went wild and landed somewhere behind the bar, and our game was over. Brad was impressed and once again asked if he could come home with me. I didn't even bother to answer this time. Mr. Surfer was too cute, and besides, we had just bonded over a black bean puck. It was last call, and I knew it was time to leave. Gentlemen, thanks for making me visible. Euston, the piano player. My favorite cousin, Joan, and her delightful lesbian partner, Isabel, invited me to join them for a two-week holiday in San Francisco. Joan is an artist, and she has lived in Costa Rica for the past 30 years. Isabel is a retired physician who worked with a very challenging population in South Africa. They have been partners for the last 10 years. The house that they occupied in San Francisco belonged to a family who did an exchange with Joan and her house in Costa Rica. The house in San Francisco was a ramshackle structure that also housed a hamster, three chickens, and a dog named Chester. I occupied one of the boys' rooms and found space for my things in between the guitar, the keyboard, and assorted athletic equipment. My bed faced out toward the street. After a few days, I got used to the street noises and lights from the street. My morning routine became a variation of my usual yoga practice. I tried to get up early enough to do a half hour of meditation and a half hour of yoga stretches. I have been doing this for the last 40 some years, and when I am a house guest, I feel a little egocentric. However, I live well with my psychic discomfort because I seem to maintain my health and well being. This morning practice extends to shared rooms on vacations shared tents camping, shared cabins on cruises, 
and it is as fundamental to me as brushing my teeth. I take my yoga mat whenever I travel. It is usually the last thing that I put in my suitcase. It then becomes the first thing out of my suitcase, so I have absolutely no excuse for not doing my practice. I have traveled on several occasions with my friend, who is a very high-powered businesswoman. She is also an early riser, and I would begin my stretches about the same time that she would begin to check her emails. At one end of our hotel room, my friend perused her emails, and at the other end of the room, I stood on my head. I have very special friends who actually embrace my egocentric behavior and admire my diligence. On this particular outing, I agreed to make our airline reservations for an upcoming trip to North Carolina. We were going to look at some investment property in a small town. I am not a real techie and still like to talk to airline reservation agents. It is true that with current outsourcing, having a conversation with someone who has an understandable accent might be the challenge. Nevertheless, I am always hopeful. On this occasion, I called the airline around 10.30 p.m. In less techie times, I have always found that calling after hours was the most successful time to attempt to make contact with airline personnel. I began my conversation with a heavily accented agent. We were finally able to understand each other. I asked him to pull up my reservation. He found the reservation and announced that it had been canceled. I said that couldn't be possible because my reservation would be held until midnight. He said, so sorry, Mum, but it is after midnight. I checked my watch. It said 10.45. I told him that it was only 10.45, and again he said, So sorry, Mum. Your reservation canceled. It finally dawned on me that with this current trend for outsourcing, I could have been calling India or who knows where else. I asked Mr. Mum where I was calling, and he said, Manila, in the Philippines. Of course, it was the next day in Manila, and I lost my reservation. I immediately asked to speak to a supervisor, who wasn't very helpful. I asked to be transferred to someone in the U.S. Well, of course, that wasn't possible, so I started all over again. By this time, it was a little after 11 p.m. Time was running out. Luckily, I was transferred to a native English speaker, who explained that the airlines were merging and she was sorry that my reservation had been canceled. The best she could do was to try to rebook the reservation. Fifteen minutes later, she successfully rebooked for an additional $200 charge. By this time, I was exhausted, frustrated, and defeated. However, I accepted the rebooking and the additional $200 charge. We finished the transaction, and I told my half-asleep friend that I was going down to the bar to have a drink. She mumbled, have a good time, and I took the elevator down to the bar. I sat down, got the bartender's attention, and ordered my usual vodka tonic. The bartender said, sorry, we are closed. I said, oh, no, you are not. Please, I need a drink. I told him about my ordeal, and he poured me a double and announced it was on the house. Coincidentally, as I pick up my pen, after not having written for nearly a week, I am once again in a bar. This bar is a very unique one. I am in an upper-class Jewish neighborhood in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I had an overwhelming desire for a toasted cinnamon bun in an East Coast diner. Please understand that if you grew up on the East Coast, there are certain things that are only available in New York City and Philadelphia. For instance, 
There are no unhealthy bagels available in California. You may see a Philly cheesesteak on the menu, but nothing like the real deal in Philadelphia. There are only designer pretzels available in California, not the genuine salty ones that are sold in the street. I think it is the touch of pollution that helps with the uniqueness of a Philly pretzel. This brings me to my toasted cinnamon bun, loaded with nuts and grilled with butter. Truly heavenly. When I was in my fourth decade, and even fifth decade, I used to exchange glances with thumpers. I've always had a certain magnetism that only certain men tune into. They would be compelled to look deeply into my eyes, and they would forget where they were going, or walk into a wall, or trip over their own feet. When I was in my prime, I frequently experienced this with consistency. Today, I had a shadow of an experience with a thumper. My fit bartender with a number 36 on his football jersey took my order. He did the glance as he took my order. I recognized the glassy look in his eyes. He walked away after he took my order and was back in a nanosecond. He had forgotten most of my order. How divine! There is life and magnetism after 60. I am visiting my younger daughter and her family. My 14-year-old grandson is the grandson that any inept computer grandmother would dream of. We checked my emails, sent some images to a researcher in Arizona, and generally bonded with the computer screen being our element of glue. My younger grandson shares my love of basketball. We watch games together, and although the love of the game is more important to me than any particular team, I still have a soft spot in my heart for the Warriors. I had the pleasure and good fortune of working with several members of the team. It was an exciting time of my life. I spent hours watching practice games and speculating about the efficient use of the body for running, jumping, shooting. I was invited to parties, dinners, and of course games, games, and more games. My friends were again patient with me and my passion and obsession for basketball. There was a point in my life when I was worse than most men. I couldn't pass a TV when there was a game on without finding out what the score was. I was fearless when I was on a mission to find out what the score was. I have gone into more than one bar where there were no women, nor would a woman want to be caught dead in some of these seedy places. On a particular rainy night in San Francisco, my lesbian cousin, her lover, and I went to a bar in the Castro. This is an area of San Francisco where gay men and some women hang out. The drugstores carry an array of sexual items that you might normally find in an adult store. Everything is out in the open, friendly and on this particular night, very rainy. My cousin, Isabel, and I took refuge in an upscale corner bar. We ordered drinks, warmed up, and dried out. We huddled around a small table and took in the sights. Some very well-dressed, attractive men were chatting with each other. A robust gentleman caught my eye and came over to our table. He introduced himself and asked how the girls were doing. It is funny, in California, girls are referred to as guys. I guess the switch in gender doesn't apply to gay bars. We were definitely girls this night. Houston was very friendly and told us about some good restaurants, invited us to hear him play the piano at one of these restaurants. Houston was so friendly that I felt free to pop the question. I asked Houston if there were a game tonight. He looked at me and he said, what game? I answered, you know, your team might be playing tonight. My team? I don't have a team. Sure you do. Your team is the Golden State Warriors. 
What do they play? It's a basketball team. Euston said, never heard of them. He turned and said, I'll ask Jason. Maybe he knows about a game. He spotted Jason and beckoned for him to come over and join us. Hey, Jason, is there a game tonight? What game? You know, a basketball game. The Warriors, our team, are they playing tonight? Euston, I don't have a team, and I don't know what you are talking about. Just a moment, I'll ask Renee. Jason found Renee and asked him to join our group. Jason asked the same question. Renee, is there a game tonight? Renee didn't have a clue, nor did he know who the Warriors are. At this point, Euston turned and looked at me and shook his head. You know, Gloria, you are just too butch for me. Being a straight lady who has a passion for basketball, I laughed for a long time. The Love of My Life Over ten years ago, I was invited to join four other women to celebrate a 60th birthday. We all gathered in Ensenada at an upscale marina and bar and did girl things. We had too many margaritas, too much lobster, and too much fun. This birthday celebration lasted for three days, and we got to know each other very well. Pasha is a well-known photographer, Cindy an entrepreneur, Robin is a school teacher, and I am an eccentric, fanatic fan of basketball. After a night of too much fun, we decided to take a walk through the old town, and we left the safe harbor of the marina. And Sonata is a fishing port, and the fish market is huge, where recently caught fish are still flopping. When my friend asked at the lobster concession if the lobster were fresh, the owner took one out of a basket, and we watched it as it walked around the fish concessions. It obviously was fresh. When we left the fish concessions, we entered the heart of town. Blankets were available for two for $15. Herbs and spices were in stalls all over. The leather shops had bags, belts, jackets, keychains, and novelty items made from leather. They had donkeys, fish, and copulating couples. The imagination of the artist who worked in leather knew no bounds. Fish tacos were sold on every street corner, along with shredded meat cut from a slab of beef. It was a lively, festive scene. If you have ever been to Mexico, you know that bad paintings on velvet are very popular. These paintings are not bowls of flowers or landscapes, but rather bullfighters with dying bulls, stereotypical senoritas with shawls on their heads, fountains flowing, and surprisingly, an occasional painting of Elvis Presley. In terms of art, they are so very bad that they hardly have a campy quality to them. Along with this very bad art are very bad sculptures and ceramic objects. You can find ceramic lovebirds, rearing horses, charging bulls, and large and small effigy of our Lord Jesus Christ. This visual trip into another time and space makes you feel like you are in a time warp. These ceramic objects extend to what used to be called piggy banks. St. Francis with his flock could very well have a slit in his back or his head for coins. With these ceramic pieces, you never really knew if you were looking at a self-contained work of art or if this thing of beauty had a utilitarian purpose. As we perused the shops and stalls, I was led by some higher power to enter one particular ceramic shop. I want to emphasize that I was led because I was in my right mind 
And yet, I had this utter compulsion to walk into this darkened, cave-like store. What was calling me? My friends were sauntering and browsing, and we all seemed to know approximately the direction we were headed. I saw Pasha on the sidewalk about 50 yards away, and I indicated that I was going to enter this shop. When I first walked in, a very hospitable middle-aged Mexican named Luis welcomed me. Buenos dias, senorita. Como esta? Bien, ¿y tú? That is basically the extent of my Spanish, but my accent is convincing, and so many Spanish speakers think that I am a Spanish speaker. Luis blasted me with his Spanish, and I broke the news that I do not speak Spanish. Oh, senorita, I am so sorry. How can I help you? I am just browsing. You have a lovely store. I turned from the counter and walked down the darkened aisles. The wooden floor and slightly dank smell only intensified the sense of being in a time warp. Luis had an eclectic collection of junk. Every item previously mentioned was displayed on shelves or on the floor. I slowly moved down each aisle and literally watched my steps. I didn't want to be responsible for incurring the expense of a broken, raging bull. Aisle after aisle of Hazarai met my eye, and then I was stopped dead in my tracks. Standing before me was an unbelievable ceramic statue of one of my heroes, Michael Jordan. Although Michael was half hidden among the other ceramic pieces, he stood out as if there were a spotlight focused on him. When I regained my composure, I closely examined Michael. He was a utilitarian bank with a slit in his head for coins. Michael was also accompanied by a Disney character, Tweety Bird. Michael stood about three feet high and Tweety Bird was about a foot high. I stood there starstruck. Finally, I walked back to the counter and told Luis that I wanted to buy Michael. Very fine selection, senorita. Do you have any bubble wrap? Please be very careful with him. I am in love with him. Luis looked at me as if I were crazy, and I suppose at that moment I was crazy. Well, as it turned out, Luis didn't know what bubble wrap is, and he didn't have any. He volunteered to wrap Michael in newspaper, but that just didn't feel right. I carefully held Michael in my arms and left the shop. The sunlight blinded me as I walked through the door. It was as if both Michael and I had God shining on us. Pasha appeared and said, I don't believe what I am seeing. Is this an apparition? No, Pasha. This is a dream come true. I finally have Michael in my arms. My dear friend, I think you have lost it. Well, let's go. I'll get the car. I have some blankets, and we will carefully wrap him up for our trip home. Our trip home was uneventful, except for a small incident. We lost Tweety Bird. Somehow, although we were very careful, Tweety Bird broke off along the base that was holding both Michael and Tweety Bird. I solved the dilemma by planting Michael in a flower box. This flower box was strategically placed so that Michael looked directly at me when I did my morning meditations. I inherited a hanging swing from the previous occupant of my apartment. A beautiful canyon view overlooked the deck where Michael and I communed. My ongoing affirmation was, let the light shine on the new healer for the bulls. I repeated this over and over, but to no avail. The bulls never responded to my email, snail mail, press kit, or video. 
I was never picked up by the bulls to be their healer. But I still had Michael. Much time passed, and the paint on Michael started to peel. I should have taken this as a sign, but I didn't and couldn't. We were both getting older, but I couldn't release him. Like fine wine, we were only getting better and more mellow. I watched the All-Star game where Michael announced his retirement. He said he was ending his career and his love-hate relationship with basketball. I understood so clearly what he meant. The game, the ambience, the skill and training are so seductive, as was my relationship to this effigy. I felt that it was time to retire my flower box adornment. I talked to Michael about a burial at sea. I had this vision of chartering a small boat and taking Michael out to sea for a proper burial. I then considered that I might be contributing to pollution. If I broke Michael into little pieces, would that pollute less? Michael never received a proper burial. When I moved from that apartment, I took Michael with me. I moved to an elegant setting. Michael no longer belonged in a flower box. I carefully wrapped Michael in bubble wrap and a blanket. He is temporarily laid to rest in my attic, and even though he is encased in bubble wrap, his spirit lives on. After all, who could conjure up such a story? The Silver Bullet The game was on. The bar stool directly in front of the TV was vacant. I grabbed it, settled in, and announced to the uninterested, clean-cut out-of-towner to my left that I was crazy about basketball. It was also my excuse for not being very sociable. If you are serious about watching a game, any game, excessive talking is not okay. One really cannot watch the nuances of the game and be chatting about the weather, the economy, politics, or even the game. Watch the plays. Look at the beauty of the ballet of basketball and keep your mouth shut. So much for the philosophy of watching a game. As it turned out, the game was not a very good one. And within a short time, I was bored and consequently struck up a conversation with the uninterested out-of-towner to my left. It is times like this that I wonder about being in the sixth decade. Would the uninterested out-of-towner be more interested if I were 30 years younger? After all, how interesting is your grandmother? Is she expected to sit in the sun and fall asleep with her mouth open? Or is she still a potential bed partner? Of course, her skin is not as toned as it was 30 years ago, and her teeth may be a little yellow, but when the lights are low, who cares? My ability to bring people out probably comes from having been a shrink for more than half of my life. I love to hear people talk about their lives and share their stories. Our conversation was progressing. The uninterested out-of-towner was from Houston, and he was here on oil business. I perked up when I heard oil. I had just had a lesson on crude by an entrepreneur who knew the business well. I showed off just a little by repeating some of my lessons from the entrepreneur. I didn't impress the out-of-towner with my limited knowledge of crude, but I did ask some questions about his work. We were interrupted by his boss, who asked what it would take to have one of my friends go out with a redneck Republican. It sounded like a question right out of Jeff Foxworthy. At that moment, I didn't have an answer, but later I realized that the right answer would have been that the redneck Republican would have to clear the four abandoned vehicles from the front yard. The entire conversation shifted, 
and redneck activities became the topic of conversation. The uninterested one had a passion for shooting game. Of course, he only shot what he could eat. His freezer was filled with boar, wild turkey, and venison. It didn't quite go with the veggie burger I had ordered, but I am not a strict vegetarian and didn't flinch when he described the contents of his freezer. The uninterested out-of-towner was now becoming interested. He was animated, a little flushed in his face, and ordering his fourth beer. I told him that my freezer has frozen salmon, string beans, and frozen ravioli. It was not nearly as well stocked as his freezer, but it served my needs. I also told him that I was a pretty good shot myself. I wasn't always a good shot, but about 15 years ago, I was being harassed by state officials who received a complaint that I was practicing veterinary medicine by applying my healing gifts to animals. This was totally absurd. I felt like a victim of the system. I received a cease and desist order with a threat of a $10,000 fine. I was virtually shut down for three months until I got to the right person who agreed that this was absurd and dismissed the complaint. In the meantime, I needed to feel empowered. I remembered Casey and his plea that I learn how to take care of myself. Casey was always encouraging me to look at his gun collection. I had absolutely no interest in guns. I am a nonviolent person who practices yoga. I hardly ever kill spiders or other insects. Yet I was ready to explore another side of my personality. I wanted to be able to defend myself and not feel like a sitting target. When I told Casey that I was ready to learn how to shoot a gun, he immediately unlocked his gun cabinet and took out one of his rifles. He handed it to me and I brought it up to my shoulder and took aim. Casey asked me where I learned how to hold a gun. I told him it was probably from doing the warrior pose in yoga for so many years. The stance just felt right. Casey wanted to take me to a shooting range, and I readily agreed. We drove out to the range, and Casey waved a $100 bill out the window and asked the person in charge to teach me how to shoot. $100 was going to buy some good instruction. The person in charge looked as if he were ready for combat. He had jungle pattern fatigues, boots, a butch haircut, and pretty blue eyes. He was very gentle with me and adapted a John Wayne kind of attitude. As I recall, he actually addressed me as little lady. He had me sit in a booth-like contraption. He put heavy muffs on my ears. He cautioned me about the recoil and told me to hold on tight. I looked through the sight and found the target he had set up for me. I followed his instructions and steadily pulled back on the trigger. He was right. The recoil was significant. He told me to try again. I did and repeated this several times. After I had fired five times, he told me he wanted to check my handiwork. He ran to the target marine style and looked at me rather quizzically. He asked if he were on candid camera. Of the five bullets I shot, four of them all went through the same bullseye, and the fifth bullet was a misfire. He couldn't believe that this was my first time out on a shooting range. He proudly handed me the target paper and suggested that I frame it. To this day, I still have that target practice. The story doesn't end here. I was so intrigued with this world of shooting that when the instructor asked me if I wanted to learn how to make bullets, I immediately took him up on his offer. We went to his garage, where he had an arsenal of God knows what, and we made bullets. These were no ordinary bullets. 
They were nearly two inches long and absolutely lethal looking. I felt empowered. Make my day, courtesy of Clint. I love my bullets. I gave one to a friend who needed to feel empowered, and I kept the other one in my medicine bag. My medicine bag contains several essentials. I keep high-potency homeopathic remedies, several silver dollars that were given to me by various gurus, a small piece of amethyst, and my prayer beads. My now-interested barmaid was very curious about the contents of my medicine bag. I told him my medicine bag was something that every well-dressed woman of a certain ilk has. He looked at me and ordered another beer and double vodka. I declined his offer of another glass of wine. I was on a talkative roll, and I didn't even need a cup of coffee to keep me going. I emptied the contents of my medicine bag, and he examined my artifacts. I told him that for years I carried my souvenir bullet in my medicine bag. I had traveled around the world with my souvenir bullet. Security personnel at airports seemed to ignore the fact that I had a live bullet in my medicine bag. Maybe it was my well-dressed, sophisticated appearance that distracted them. But alas, in our little dinky Santa Barbara airport, I was found out. A young security guard carefully scanned the contents of my handbag. She said, Am I seeing things, or do you have a bullet in your handbag? I claimed innocence and said, Oh my, I completely forgot about that. You'll have to wait in our high-risk security area while I talk to my supervisor. I could see a lot of trouble coming down the pike. I waited for 15 minutes and a very burly supervisor cross-examined me. I told him it was only a souvenir, and I meant no harm. After examining the other items in my medicine bag, I think he believed me. After all, does a real terrorist carry homeopathic remedies, silver dollars from the guru, a piece of amethyst and prayer beads? My now-interested out-of-towner Ask me what I do with my prayer beads. I told him that I use them for dowsing. His face immediately lit up. He asked if I could douse for water. I told him I could and have successfully found water. He then asked if I could douse for oil. I told him I didn't see why not. The now very interested barmaid asked if I could help him. His company was looking for offshore oil, and they weren't sure where to look. I immediately got an impression which I have come to trust. These guys were going to have a problem in their pipeline. I didn't want to break the news without more information. The very interested one agreed to send me a grid. I, in turn, agreed to study it, and for the first time in a long, long time, my dinner and drinks were paid for. It was a delightful evening. I enjoyed the quirkiness. I remember from my days of visibility that the smart woman leaves the bar before last call. It was getting late. I left with a secret smile on my face. The uninterested became interested. My bar bill was taken care of and my invisibility status as a 60-something changed to one of high visibility.